Welcome to The Response, a show about how communities respond to disaster. In this episode, we've brought on JT, Savage, and Nay from The Hood Squad, a mutual aid and police accountability organization based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Through their six principles of peace, love, harmony, balance, unity, and justice, the Hood Squad aims to shift the systemic oppression which has targeted the disenfranchised communities of the world. We discuss their origins as an art and media collective, their expansion into a very broad array of mutual aid work, including police patrols or night shifts and disaster relief, and how the Hood Squad reinvests in their community with farming and training for self-sufficiency, self-awareness, and community responsibility. Here's Robert Raymond, who will be hosting today's interview. Welcome to The Response. It's great to have you all on. And I guess to start, I'm wondering if you all could introduce yourselves and maybe just talk a little bit about your role in the squad and, yeah, just a bit about, like, how you came to do the work that you're doing. Okay. I'm JT. stands for Justice for Tyranny. That's a pseudonym that I got from years of doing art and doing art around uh, social change and social justice work. I do a lot of social commentary. I'm Savage. I'm the VP of the Hood Squad and co-founder. I've been doing this work for as long as I can remember. And then I'm Nay. I've been volunteering with the Hood Squad since last year. Came into contact with them through some grassroots community work and just have stuck with them since then. So for me, right. what got me started doing this with our art collective, we had a, well, as far as the mutual aid goes, we had a, a an elder that reached out to us about, about some RVs that were folks that were being displaced in the RVs in our community. And it just kind of launched a chain of events that led into us starting mutual aid. As an organization, what got us started was the murder of Mario Woods. This was about seven years ago in San Francisco. And having the need and to want to create our own narrative around the things that are happening in the community versus having other people tell our stories and tell them incorrectly and oftentimes demonize us. So we started the Hood News, which was basically just neighborhood news, just trying to get the word out for things that were happening in our neighborhood. That led to the Hood Squad, and shortly thereafter, the Hood Squad started doing mutual aid and a lot of outreach in the community. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that history. And yeah, so tell tell us a little bit more about the Hood Squad, like where you work out of, and just, yeah, maybe highlight some of the, the work that you do, and we can get more into the details of each program. But yeah, just maybe give us like a, a little bit of an orienting, like overview of, of what you all do. Sure. So we still create media. We're working on, we're currently working on a documentary that is about some of the corrupt policing in the Bay Area that adversely affects our neighborhoods, our our economy, like our ability to money, and ultimately being a tool of gentrification. We also have another documentary that we've been working on for some time about a black motorcycle club. And so we still do art in this way together. We also do mural work together. We've done Black Lives Matter murals in the streets a couple of times, most recently in East Palo Alto. And as far as the mutual aid, we do that a lot. We have a public health and safety program. We have a farm called Hood Squad Farms. It's actually a farming network. And Sav, you have anything to say about <laughs> any of those? Maybe about the farm? We could talk about that a little bit. How it started? Sure. Well, yeah, that sounds great. Farm... <laughs> The farm started basically because we realized that the community was in need and we had a couple chickens and we were making omelets one day and we were passing it out to the RVs with the propane and we realized the high demand for food was a lot of the time more impactful than the gas itself. So we realized that there was a need and it wasn't just in our community, it was in communities all over the Bay. And we just took that as a call to action and, you know, here we are. 
Yeah, we started uh, we started putting the farm together, like she said, around that time. At that time, we were doing services for the RV community in East Palo Alto, and we were giving them a propane. There were some students from Stanford that secured some funding, and they gave it to us to facilitate getting folks what they needed over there. So what we did was we kept giving them propane for their RVs. We kept fueling up their vehicles, registration on their vehicles, things like that. And during that time, we, we did a couple meals for them. And we saw, Sav pointed out how impactful it was. And, uh, and we thought, wow, we need to really make a bigger effort with food. And that led to us taking on a project of building a very large chicken and also trying to facilitate other members to build chicken coops on their properties, basically to pool our harvest together and make omelets. And so right, right about the time when we finished the chicken and we did our first official omelet omelet breakfast, a meal for the program, the pandemic hit. So it was kind of, it was kind of a weird feeling because I would say prior to that, it was like people in the community, I felt like thought we were a little crazy. Like, why are they doing, why are they building these chicken coops? And, but I'll say like when the pandemic hit, we felt like we was Noah in the ark. We're like, the ark's done mm. and here's the flood. We told you. But <laughs> for us, um, well, maybe we'll get more in depth in that later, but it has to do a lot with not wanting to rely on the system to take care of us and wanting community care to be a way of having a, a sustainable, surefire way that, that people are having their needs met especially in marginalized communities. I mean, you look at places, not just in the Bay Area, but around the country, you have people that have poisoned water and, you know, nobody's helping them out. There's, and not just one place, I think Jackson has bad water, Flint, ha or yeah, Flint, Michigan has bad water. And it, it's like, goes on for years. And unless those people can help themselves, they're stuck in a bad situation. And I would say the same is also true when it comes to disasters, your community can go be shut down and, and maybe not get relief for two or three weeks. It's things that, that very easily happen. And I would say black and brown communities are usually the first that are forgotten about and the last to be served. So I don't know if I mentioned, but we also do disaster relief. And um, so really our, our farming program was the first kind of big step that we took towards that and our meal program the the free omelet breakfast being the first part of our mutual aid going out there and doing that in places like oakland oakland we're in oakland all the time i used to live in oakland and most of the the majority of our first members came out of oakland so we were pretty much an oakland group that was based in East Palo Alto mm -hmm. and being that most of our members were from Oakland in the beginning. And so, yeah, we would take our omelets. We would go to all the encampments before the ending of the pandemic. The encampment situation was huge. It was huge. We, we would literally bring over a thousand meals that we cook on a four, four burner stove out into the street and feed people. And like, we we're doing more for the people in the street than, than their cities were. And we'd feed farm workers. We'd go down to Salinas, Watsonville, all these areas. We feed unhoused farm workers, basically anybody that needed food. I keep saying like in the, in the Bay area where we are out here in Northern California, everything is so high priced that you're not, a lot of people are not above the poverty line. They may, have a house or a, a, an apartment or some place to stay. They may be their f whole family may be staying in, in someone's home, and the money that they're making is is going straight to rent and keeping this shelter over their head, and they don't have money for food. So it's all, it's not just unhoused folks that we feed. It's anybody that's hungry.
Yeah. Anybody in these streets is hungry. And let me give somebody else an opportunity to talk. I feel like I'm talking too much. But if if you want to talk about maybe some of the work that we do. I mean, with anybody who's hungry, you would be surprised. Like go, going into a community to go feed them. You would be surprised how many people who you wouldn't turn a blind eye to or you wouldn't necessarily think are in need. You would be surprised how many people are actually need. Like I know when we go through my community, mm -hmm. like familiar, familiar faces even will take the food because everybody could use a free meal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, and the yeah. meals going into everyone's neighborhood, we were able to identify other things that folks needed. So our mutual aid really expanded far beyond just meals. Mm -hmm. uh, like currently we, we pass out sleeping bags, tents, we do drives, we go to encampments, mm -hmm. ask people, what do you need? Like, what do you need out here? And turn to social media, try and make those things happen. Really just trying to give some radical care to the community that for us don't even really feel radical, yeah. but yeah. So, I mean, for yeah, us, no, I, I really appreciate that point yeah. Yeah. about the radical, like it, it's not really radical. <laughs> I, yeah, I really appreciate yeah, that it's point. Not, it's not, it, it's, it's, it's normal. It's regular, but, but <laughs> it's not normalized because of capitalism and, and the way that people really put profit over everything else. We do a lot of police accountability. I mentioned how yep. we got started behind the energy from Mario Woods murder and police accountability is a huge part of what we do, especially for public health and because it is counterproductive for law enforcement to also be in the business of public health and safety because literally Enforcing laws with firearms creates public safety hazard. You have people that literally carry around guns because police do. You have people that are in so much fear of this police state that they keep their, themselves armed. And that's across all demographics, except for the, the very wealthy. The very wealthy, the police are their militia or whatever. But this all comes from capitalism. This all comes from folks that value profit over lives, profit over care. It's, it's like the nature of the beast. And so I guess it's, it's always interesting to me when we have this perception as a society and clearly not, not all of us in society are fooled enough to buy into that perception, but it's a, it's a widespread public perception is promoted on television, radio, movies about police, the police narrative and the police being those that serve and protect and look out for everyone in the community. And it's just not what the reality is. It's just not, you, you just recently had a black man in Los Angeles that was flagging down the police for a car accident and then a half an hour later they kill him they tase him to death and it's just it's all too it happens all too often so while we're out distributing care for the community we're also holding police accountable police and the police we see a situation occurring we stop we monitor it some if they're engaging in somebody with somebody we hop out we ask the person hey man are you okay is everything all right We'll ask the cops, hey, what's going on? Because we want to know what they're going to say is going on. Sometimes you can find out a lot about situations just from them not wanting to say what's going on, them giving you some, you know, weird answer, or them literally trying to tell you about criminalizing somebody. And if the person says to us, I'm good, I'll say, okay, well, do you want me to record it or are you straight? If they're, if they're good, I'm leaving. But... Most of the time they're like, nah, it's stay here, record, like, mm -hmm. you know, and we've been able to help a lot of situations like that. We had one in the recent past where there's this group actually in Menlo Park of police officers that I feel like are a spawn off of an old East Palo Alto police gang called the Wolf Pack. You can Google it. 
If you, if they haven't mm-hmm. taken down all the information, they're really good at that, making information disappear. And now that we rely on the internet and nothing's in print anymore. But the Wolf Pack used to be a gang in East Palo Alto. Some of those cops in that same energy are in Menlo Park Police Force, which polices East Palo Alto. They ride around, just like in Oakland. Oakland had a, a huge child sex trafficking scandal a few years ago that the streets ain't forgot about. We still, regardless if you can find a whole bunch on it, we still remember. But yeah, criminalizing somebody. And when I asked what was going on and I stayed there with my cameras and I kept engaging the police to try and basically get them to divulge some of the corrupt stuff that they were doing. And eventually they just let, they let the guy go. They just let him go. They didn't want to be on camera no more. And that that is effective in Oakland. We do most of our night work in Oakland because of the way mm-hmm. that the underground economies are set up. So if you don't know about the links between capitalism and underground economies, boy, capitalism is the reason why people are put in unsafe situations to get money because they're trying to survive. And so it's important that we look out for people that are in unsafe situations. It's back to the point of public health and safety. So a lot of what we do um, in public health and safety, we have two shifts. We have our day shift and our night shift. And on the night shift, we, we do the same stuff. We feed people. We, if it's raining, we bring rain jackets, rain gear, tents, sleeping bags. You know what I'm saying? We pass those out to folks that need that. But also we go through neighborhoods and areas where underground economies are occurring. And we do that to offer assistance in any way that we can. We have some medical training, being able to, to stop trauma bleeding if somebody's shot or stabbed, CPR, things like that, things that'll keep people alive in time to get them to a doctor. But we literally go through what they call the track or the blade, the whole stroll. I don't know what what is the correct term that, that, that people outside of the street use, but it's where the business of the sex industry, the CD underground sex industry, sex in the street takes place. And it's very dangerous, very, 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 very dangerous. And a big part of that danger is the police. It's not just the people in the streets. It's not just the shootings that occur. It's also the legal and illegal activities of the police. I pass out condoms, we pass out safety kit. And one of the things that has happened to us numerous occasions is as we're driving, doing the speed limit, having the cops blast the brightest light in the car to where you can't even see the road coming from the opposite direction, trying to see who's in that car, blasting the brightest light. All they see is dark faces in the car, blasting the brightest light in the car and almost go off the road. I've had all kinds of interactions with police out there being hostile to us, telling us they don't like what we're doing. First, it's what are you doing? You tell them and it's, oh, we don't like what you're doing. Uh, I'm like, I don't care. It's not illegal. And we're going to keep helping people in these streets. And I've, I I've, I always point out the fact that we've rescued a 12-year-old girl from being sex trafficked. We've pulled out, we've extracted a, a, a young woman in her 20s who was being domestically abused, domestic violence situation and human trafficking at the same time. This is like the work that we do in the night. And if you recall, as far as what the police do at night, besides shining flashlights, bright spotlights in people's cars as the vehicles are moving, they were also engaged in a huge child sex trafficking ring at night where officers were passing around this this minor. It was all in the newspapers and all on the probably around, I don't know, 2016 or sometime around then. And so it's just ironic when we have these cops that are maybe new on the force or whatever in Oakland, and they're like, what are you doing? Nah, 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 nah. And I'm like, dude, you are the problem. Don't ask me what I'm doing. What are you doing? You're the problem out here. Like you, you guys are the ones that are abusing black and brown women and children. So 
That whole situation is disgusting. And I would say, in general, police officers have a lot of that response to us doing mutual aid and helping people. We were helping some folks the other night and literally passing out food. And when we were actually in in East Palo Alto, and one of the cops said to us, so we pulled up on, on one street in the G and we saw some police activity. As usual, we stopped, we monitor. And as soon as we stopped, the police drove off. So we went back to feeding people. About, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes later, we went to a local laundromat to pick up our laundry that we dropped off where we were drying some clothes for some unhoused folks. And the police, this, I didn't even know it was the same police, but there was some more, there was more police activity. So we stopped again to see what was going on. And I literally saw one of the cops like bobblehead, head turned around, kept looking at our car, then all on her, her CB and, and brought the cops, one of the cops out from whatever they were doing inside of somebody's home. And they come out, start writing our plates down, start approaching the car, blast their light on us. So I turned my light on them and, and I'm like, what's going on? Well, what are you doing? And they're like, what are you doing? You're following us around. I'm like, we're not following you around. We're, 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 we're passing food out and doing our jobs. But this is the, this to me is like a systemic issue where police, so they told me, oh, well, we're worried about our, our safety right now. So we came to see who it is. And it's, it, they're always worried about their safety when they're in black and brown communities and the public is the target. It's literally a war on the underclass. These police officers are military trained. They're trained by military contractors and they are taught to react to the people that they're sworn to protect as the enemy, as their, com- their combatant. And these are the, these are the reasons why there's a need for our art collective to step up and be in the streets in this way. And I do just want to step in if I can. With all of this police accountability work that we do, de-escalation work, even with farming, even with supporting our community through all these other ways that Savage and JT have mentioned, handing out food, handing out track packs on the night shifts, all of it comes out of necessity for us based on our lived experiences as black and brown residents of these neighborhoods in the Bay Area. So that's another reason, going back to that point earlier about radical care, why to us, this doesn't even necessarily feel like radical care. It's just us moving out of necessity, responding to community needs, responding based on the realities of our existences here in these neighborhoods where we find ourselves. And we are able to have such a wide reach of programs and activities that we do because it comes from not only our experiences, but also listening directly to our community members. The Hood Squad is very recognizable and I would say well-loved and well-respected and also approachable amongst our community members. Um, Thankfully, our neighbors feel comfortable reaching out to us even when they don't feel comfortable reaching out to these other entities such as the police, such as other emergency responders. They feel comfortable reaching out to us and voicing their needs to us and we do respond accordingly. Even like, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, but even with like this recent flooding that happened, like community members, even when they didn't necessarily know who else to reach out to, they knew that they could call on the hood squad and that we would respond accordingly. So all of this care, it goes both ways as we're putting in all this labor and work into our community. The community is also feeding back to us. Like there is no separation, us and community. The community is Mm -hmm. feeding back to us, um, keeping us informed of what's going on, looking out for our safety as we're putting in the work, supporting us financially and through other donations. So I did just want to highlight that that community love and respect that exists across all of the programs that you hear us mentioning in this interview today. Absolutely. Hmm. And if I could jump on the Yeah, thank you so much for that. The Sorry. um tail code of what Nate was saying. Yeah. During the, the past the recent floods, 
that have been hitting us out here in the Bay Area in California. We had creeks that were flooding into people's homes, apartment buildings, carports to where their cars were underwater. And we had a lot of messages coming to our accounts. What's going on? Please help. Da, 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 da. Can you please tell us what, what, what the emergency response is basically from the state? Like what, what, are, what are they doing? And where so, are they? yeah, where are they? All of that. And so we tapped in with those first responder responders and got the official response for what was happening and what the, they were doing, brought that back to the community. Let them know that we can get volunteers if they need volunteers or help. I, I myself also was there to help clear the creek. They had an excavator that was coming in and at first uh, they were unaware if they had an operator. So I'm a trained, also a trained heavy equipment operator through the local union three. And, and so basically was on standby for while the equipment was being transported in, if they didn't have an operator, I was there to operate that equipment. We helped people set up their sandbags, basically whatever, whatever folks needed during that time yeah. we were there. It's important to say that we stay ready. So we never got to get ready. We got, we stay with mm -hmm. survival kits in the car flares, gas masks, if there's smoke, fire extinguishers, we put out car fires, all kinds of stuff in the streets and in our communities, just being the first people to show up, the first people to see an accident, we're always in the street. So yeah, those are the, the kinds of things that, that, that we, at least in our public health and safety disaster program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, like really rich and like helpful understanding of like what you do in the context and the environment sort of in, in which you're, you guys are doing all the work that you're doing. There's like so many points that you hit where I'm just like writing notes because I wanted to like sort of underscore some of the points here. Like, first of all, I think it's a really interesting sort of arc you mentioned, um, Noah's arc and, and the fl sort of the, the you, you were talking about like a metaphorical flood when you all started with your omelets and it sort of come full circle now you're actually helping folks in literal floods <laughs> yeah. and the like the the community that you have sort of built and the trust that you've built in your own community and the the work that you've done has gone from yeah making breakfasts to so 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 many other things and I also want to really underscore and highlight this really important connection that you made with the work that you're doing around police accountability and the connection between capitalism and policing. And I was lucky enough to speak with Kat Brooks of the Anti-Police Terror Project a, a little while ago, and she had a lot of similar points. And one of the things that she also drew on that, that you mentioned is this idea of the underground economy. And I just remember one of the quotes that she said was just like, folks got to eat. And in a capitalist economy, you're going to have people who are pushed out of that formal economy and that they're driven to these underground informal economies and everybody's just trying to get by. And unfortunately, the police exist as sort of like you mentioned, like frontline soldiers on this class war of the capitalist class against the rest of us, really. And um, certain communities are definitely disproportionately impacted by that. And I think that the work that you're doing is really remarkable in going out and, and really in the tradition of, of the sort of the Black Panthers in Oakland and, and their Panther patrols, I believe that's what they were calling it back then. And it's like unfortunate that this work still has to be done, but it's really important work. And thank you so much for sharing the, the specifics of, of what you all deal with on sort of a day to day, night to night basis doing that stuff. And yeah, I guess you've touched on so many of the points that I, I was going to ask. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask maybe just as we, unless there's anything else that you all want to talk about in terms of the specific work that you're doing on the ground, if there's anything else that you want to add about the, the recent storms, I'm also really interested in, and you've touched on this a lot, but sort of maybe zooming out a little bit and, and getting a sense of like, what individuals, what organizations, sort of both historical and in the present, have and are inspiring your work? And maybe also a little bit too, like explicitly on the, the idea and the importance of mutual aid 
And what else sort of, what other frameworks or concepts sort of do you use, would you describe in your approach to, I guess, transforming your communities and your systems? For me personally, I would say it's the UNIA led up by Honorable Marcus Garvey. And also what has inspired me is the care, the community care that takes place in other neighborhoods in other countries in the diaspora. Well, I'm part West Indian, and so when I go home to the Caribbean, what I, what I have seen and grown up being a part of with my older family members, my older cousins, caring for their community, how they care for their community, how they put that community care first before what the system says that they should or shouldn't do has always inspired me, especially as a young man. Um, also something that I found actually a piece of literature that I found to inspire me was a book called black Indians. And it was a book mostly about the Seminole Indians in Florida and their connection and marriage to black culture. And, you know, from accepting escape Africans, Africans escaping enslavement into their tribe, marrying into their tribe and going on and fighting the, the US government that was engaged in a genocide. Things like that inspired me. Also, obviously the Black Panthers inspired me and not just the, the historical version of the Black Panthers, but that everyone knows, but also what is told to us through our elders. There, there's this historical version of things and then in, in usually in black cultures and in some other cultures also, there's this legacy of, of, of speaking down the information, passing down information from the elders. And uh, yeah, I, I come from a, a community where, um, you know, that all of that is important, a Pan-African school system in East Palo Alto that I was a part of. And so for me, that's, what my inspiration, a lot of my inspiration comes from. So, I can chime cool. in. Thank um, you for that. Speaking for myself as well. Um, I'm, first of all, also greatly inspired, have the greatest reverence and respect for the original Black Panther movement. And then personally, I admire and align myself with any movements that are empowering black and brown communities from an approach that works across genders and across generations. I think it's important that all of us are participating in the work within the community. All of us are benefiting from the work. At the Hood Squad, we say that we are spiritual vigilantes and that like spiritual aspect of it all is important for me as a foundation as well. I do have a belief that our people in whatever neighborhood we find ourselves in, black communities, brown communities, like Latinos, indigenous people, I do believe that we are divinely connected and powerful. And that is the foundation for my belief that within our community, we have everything we need. We have all of the skill sets, all of the resources if we really came together and worked together. We have the talent, we have the ideas, we have everything we need amongst ourselves. So there really is no need to rely on or beg from these greater systems. And so the Hood Squad is like very much in alignment with those beliefs that are foundational to me and the way that they move is showing me how much anything really is possible when our communities just come together. Can I say mm -hmm. one more thing on that? Cause she just pulled something out that I, I don't know why I overlooked, but the spiritual aspect of uh, mm -hmm. what we do. And I have been inspired with the ancestral traditions of the Yoruba and the Ifa tradition, which is also in the diaspora in the Caribbean where I come from. And, and when we're out there doing the work, there is very much 
a spiritual part to what we're doing, especially in the night. It's very dangerous work and we are just acting as agents in this realm of the ancestors. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, well, yeah, that's really, really inspiring to hear. And, and thank you all for sharing about some of your inspirations and and that spiritual element too, I think is, is really key. And can you guys hear me? Okay. I think I might've lost you for just a sec, but I think you're back. Yeah. Um, dropped off. Can you hear me? Okay. Right now. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I guess as we wrap up here, if there's anything else that I didn't really touch on that you wanted to, any of you wanted to, to talk about, and also like, what can, what can people do to help support you? If people want to get involved, I know you have your omelet breakfasts, like just, yeah, anything that people want to get involved, if they want to support, where can they do, where, where can they go? What the, and uh, what can they do? Good question. I would say, so volunteering is great, but to volunteer for us and the work we do requires that you train with us. There's a lot of training. We, especially when we're going out in the streets, I don't allow for untrained people to come out with us because it's, it's just too dangerous. So volunteering is great if you're willing to, to put in the time that it takes to train and also resources like when we put out calls for unhoused folks that need tarps and tents and blankets and stuff like that, that's amazing if you're, if you're monitoring our pages and you can respond and help. If you don't have those resources, if you can share our our posts and our information with folks that do. And then a huge thing, which is so overlooked oftentimes and for a number of reasons is the, the understanding that we do not support capitalism. We're living in a capitalist country and it takes fuel for us to get to these places. And there's a huge cost for us to supply our vehicles with things that we need to do our job, medical gear, and there's actually a large expense month to month for us to, to be in the street. So like we recently did a, a GoFundMe for our day and night operations. We, we price things out and our operations are, they're about $6,000 a month for us to be running. So there's times when we can't be out in the streets because we're underfunded and we're just like, damn, we wish we could help, but we don't have any funding. So that's, that's another reality for what we do. Like sometimes there's messages that we can't respond to because we don't have the ability to, which is sad. So for those that do have those financial resources to contribute to what we're doing for those that, that don't have those resources, but have a network full of resources, sharing the information and, and having, helping us fundraise, it's a, it's a big. It's a big issue. Thank you all so much. This has been, I think, a really important insight into the work that you're doing and the context in which you're working. And I, yeah, really appreciate you all taking the time to, to talk to us at the, the response here. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having us on here, man, and helping us get this information out. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to an interview with The Hood Squad. Check out their work and learn more about upcoming events at thehoodsquad.com. That's the with an A. On Instagram, at The Hood Squad, and on Facebook and YouTube, at The Hood News. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here and follow at Response Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find out more from us and listen to past interviews and audio documentaries by visiting thereponsepodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you in two weeks. Until next time, take care of each other.